So in this situation, the, the, the talk about you know the, the Congress centric anti-BJP alliance, I think it, it is losing its sheen in the sense no, that Congress see, is not the very important player in this situation exactly. at all. In 2004 also it was not Congress centric. It became Congress led UPA post election. Pre-election there was nothing Congress centric. Okay. And uh, I remember because I was involved in all those yeah, yeah, discussions. <laughs> but, 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 completely. You are one of the architects of this whole thing. <laughs> no, no, I, and we were constantly telling the Congress leaders also, no, forget there's already a thing. No, you're, there's nothing else. Post-election, once you defeat and maximize your seats, then we'll sit together and then form the front. And that, by principle, it goes to the single largest party among the combination. Yes. Congress was just 142 then. Nobody could have imagined in an earlier period somebody forming a settled government with just 142 or do they require 272? 272 MPs, huh? yeah. But Congress could form because of all these allies. It is then that the terminology UPA when it came. So it was then called the Congress led UPA. UPA. That's how Manmohan Singh became. Otherwise, there's no question of under anybody's leadership. And today, the Congress is in a much worse situation. Congress today, I mean, you see, every other day you'll find some leader going to the BJP. So the BJP is really not uh, really so scared of the Congress. They can buy up as many as they happen whenever they want to. Unfortunate, but, but that is what is happening. Whatever it be, how the party is run or, you know, these, the party leaders are impatient. I mean, they want the spoils of office you know, <laughs> so a bit earlier, whatever it may be. But this is happening. So, Congress is weakening. So, in that situation, it is actually a combination of secular forces. Who will be the leadership of that? That will emerge only post-election. And in this whole scenario, especially with the regional, uh, uh, as far as CPM is concerned, the only sore note happens to be West Bengal and Mamada Banerjee. And Mamada Banerjee is one of the very, very, I mean, in the forefront of, at least in Bengal, in the anti-BJP uh, fight. So, how do you try to, I mean, how the CPM is going to accommodate well, or... You see, Bamta Banerjee is maybe for the sake of positioning and publicity being anti-BJP. But remember, BJP's entry into Bengal was because of her. Remember, she was with the NDA for over a decade. She was a cabinet minister with under Vajpayee. Yes. Twice, yes. under various portfolios. Yeah. So, she was the vehicle through which BJP entered. And BJP would be very happy with her if the left, I mean, if the, if the left were not there. The, the entire question is, and look at the methodology that is being employed. The way this entire politics of hate and violence that the BJP does is exactly what Mamta has been doing for the last uh, 10 years in Bengal since she's come. So it's not that Mamta is an anti-BJP. I mean, that happened during the last elections when people of Bengal wanted to keep BJP out. So it was got nothing to do with TMC. It was the people of Bengal and thanks to the entire Hindu, Hindutva, Hindi campaign that the BJP ran. That the Bengalis found it very offensive against their own culture. And there is a kind of a feeling that some of the CPM supporters voted for TMC to keep the BJP, BJP out. out. I mean, you see, not our cadre, not our workers, etc. But maybe our sympathizers to a large election. But the overriding sentiment in those elections was keep the BJP out. Today, right now, a huge uh, movement that is going on over the death of uh, unfortunately the student, Khan, the student, student leader. Massive thing, and, and the way the, our uh, youth and students are being attacked by the police, by Mamta Benerjee, etc., there. And as uh, our secretary, uh, a girl who fought against Mamta Benerjee in the last uh, assembly, assembly election, Min Minakshi. Yeah. And she was brutally beaten up and almost broke her spine. Uh, you know, so these sort of attacks that continue in Tripura. I was there last week, we had a party state conference and for the first time again that uh, traditional uh, ground was completely chock-a-block of filled for our party rally. So that, that revival in terms of people's movement struggles, that is now growing. Now the question is, 
whether that can will be allowed to be reflected electorally. And look at Tripura and Bengal, the recent local body elections. Opponents were not allowed to file the nominations. If you file the nominations, first of all, not allowed to file, be beaten up, and again with police backing them. Because the the Tripura BJP of, seems to have taken a leaf out of Amata's book. In, in Tripura, <laughs> yeah. they are exactly doing the same the thing. Same thing. So that is where the problem is. That you see, in the last ten years, we have lost more than 300 of our very, very strong cadre. Uh, lakhs of our families had to be relocated in order to do it in Bengal. And same here in uh, Tripura. Even in a short period, more than 22 of our comrades were killed. All our party offices attacked. And they thought that this sort of an attack will decimate us. No. But despite all this, I, I agree with all the violence and all this uh, oppression which is being unleashed against the party. But the party has also committed some grave mistakes in these two states. That, obviously, the that's why the situation has come. So how do you? So how is the rectification process is on? No, no, that we have recognized and done. But right now, it is the focus is strengthening people's struggles. That is the only way forward. Hmm. And um, in your press conference today, you said that, you know, when the whole country is going for private capital and private investment, Kerala cannot remain as an island in itself and you cannot... <laughs> no, what I, what, what, I meant, what I meant to say is, the economic policy and the principles and the norms in the country are decided by the central government. Yes. That's your constitution. Right? Yes. Now, the central government doesn't bar private capital from coming. Yeah. Now, in Kerala, for a number of years also, we've been saying private industry coming because Kerala has developed in terms of their traditional industries and has become number one state in terms of human development indices, etc., etc. That is, to a large extent, the left's contribution in doing that. But now, you require a stage whereby some degree of employment opportunities, some degree of uh, economic growth in terms of prosperity, etc. That will have to be... I mean, enlarged, and how will you do that? That is the issue before the party and the government. And in that, we are discussing it. I mean, the state conference discussion, a vision for a new. Uh, uh, so the, the the vision document yeah. has apparently become quite. Uh, Quite contra I will not say controversial, but uh, uh, generating a lot of heat in the sense that whether the CPM is going back or even, I mean, I don't even say going back or deviating from its core ideological not at principles. All, not at all. I mean, we have seen this. With, uh, you see, the, the point is that there is no deviation in that sense. Yeah. Private in investment is not an anathema for the CPM. Private investment will come, foreign investment will come. That is the law of the land. Yeah. But when it comes to places where we are strong, what is crucial to be examined is that in what are the terms at which it is coming? Are the terms at which private investment comes into Kerala? Are those terms in the interests of Kerala and the people of Kerala? Or are they terms which will only exploit them further for profit maximization of the of whoever brings this capital? Now that is what has to be, that is the crucial issue. The crucial issue is not whether foreign capital will come or not, private capital will come or not. The crucial issue is on what terms is it coming. And that terms, there we are extremely vigilant. That will have to be in the interest of Kerala state as well development, as well as the people's interest. See, there is a feeling, I mean, whether it is right or wrong, I don't know. But there is a feeling that you know, just like uh, what was adopted by China in the late 80s, you know, the famous quote by the mm -hmm. Deng Xiaoping, whether the cat is black or white, the issue is whether it catches the mice. Yeah, yeah. So we should have a same kind of a pragmatic approach in terms no, no, they're, of... There is the confusion among the people of Kerala. Okay, I mean, I, mean, I can understand their, uh, you know, degree of confidence and uh, things like that. The confusion of people of Kerala is that you are not running the state of India. <laughs> you know, it is a state government within the larger uh, you know, Republic of India. Yeah. The Republic of India is run by certain policies and certain norms. Now, you are part of one of the states. So, you cannot resume the role like Deng Xiaoping and say, decide the state policy. The state policy is decided elsewhere. Our arch rival in Kerala 
was the uh, the ruling party at the center. What happened to their policies when they brought in private capital and when they allowed this entire neoliberalization to take place? It was, after all, this entire question of privatization, process of joining globalization, was done by the Congress, no? Yes. Uh, I mean, it, it is they who, I mean, today they are saying that, oh, you are violating and all these things, etc. But they are the ones who brought this uh, neoliberal order to India. They are the ones who actually allowed the privatization of our national assets. They began that whole process. So, the question is, while they were not vigilant on the terms in which this capital is coming, we are very, very vigilant. So, you are confident that you will be able to bring a kind of a private capital which will serve the interest of the people instead of serving the interest of the capital? No, it will be mutual. It'll be, it has to be mutual, otherwise why will that capital come? Yeah. And it has to be mutual, but, but it cannot be at the expense of fleecing or exploiting Kerala's resources or the uh, labor of Kerala's people. And um, particularly within even the a large fraternity of the left itself, there are a large, I mean, large number of apprehensions about some of these policy issues and uh, some of the projects being followed by the government. We'll, we'll, we'll have to patiently explain to them. Mm. And we'll have to, uh, that will do. That will do. But listen, even for Kerala to sustain its human development indices, you require a standard of living. Without a standard of living, you cannot maintain these uh, human development uh, indicators. Now, those resources, how do you generate? How do you get it? Particularly with a hostile central government and with these attacks on fiscal fundamentalism, I mean, fiscal federalism. And, and with those uh, those attacks, how do you garner resources? I mean, these are all much larger connected issues. But these will all have to be patiently discussed, worked out, and then... Uh, uh, and you know, the critics, in fact, is pointing out that the party, instead of focusing on such issues like the fiscal federalism and uh, the way the state's rights are being uh, taken away by the center, they are going on the easy way of, you know, attracting capital and then that will take no, a... No capital is going to come looking at uh, the CM's face or my face or anybody's face. <laughs> capital will come only when it sees profit possibility. That is when capital flows. That is the integral logic of capitalism. Okay, so it's not that we are going around attracting capital, etc., etc. But the entire issue of uh, fiscal federalism, that is an issue that the left has championed and we have taken up this issue, continue to take it up. But the question is of mobilizing all the non-BJP chief ministers and finance ministers. Is there any possibility of such a, I mean, I believe that the Tamil Nadu chief ministry is uh, calling for a meeting in on these issues. Yes, and we have uh, urged him to do that also. Okay. Oh, and we, uh, we have urged him because there are internal contradictions. You see, yeah. if, if we call, certain parties won't come. If somebody else calls, we won't go. <laughs> okay. You know, the, so, so the point is, but this is in the interest of India. So this is a kind of a neutral territory. Yeah, you are. So, so I've also personally appealed to the CM of uh, some time ago. Okay. I went and personally met him in Chennai. Uh, and do it. But I think after these round of elections, it'll it'll fructify. And another important issue is that you know the left emerging as a kind of a separate block, the left unity. I mean, and uh, and it it I mean on a uh, all India level, it is still remaining as a kind of a distant dream. What would I mean? I'm not saying that the unity of CPA or CPM mm -hmm. or something like it, but as a kind of a broad uh, this thing. As yes, there are problems. Yeah. We we are conscious of it. You see. CPI, CPIM, it's not a question of merger of the parties. Yeah. But as far as CPI, CPM are concerned, they, there's much greater cohesion. We are seeing eye to eye on almost everything. Yeah. And, and we are going together. Mm. But with the other left forces, there are certain problems of their perception, their understanding and yeah. things like that. But that we are in the process of discussing. We said, nevertheless, that is that has to be overcome as well as possible. And even in this, especially in the background of what you call the authoritarian right-wing forces gaining uh, the power in yes, the country, yes. don't you think that even the non-parliamentary left should be incorporated? Well, that is up to them, <laughs> what, they, what they want to do. They, they do not, not that we, uh, we send them out, they broke away and left, no? They broke away and left and said that the uh, power flows from the barrel of the gun. <laughs> so, so, but when we are talking of this sort of a left, it's, it's in the process of democratic process. It's up to them whether they want to come or not, one section of them. 
yeah. came, which is today CPIML. Yes. I mean, they came. Yeah. That's right. We are working with them. They are part of the you know overall uh, left front, etc. So that that is the process. But then remember, all this will happen and will materialize in a tangible manner through the rise of people struggles. And that is the final point which we are asking. <laughs> you are, there is uh, a tremendous uh, impact on created by the present yeah, movement, former struggle. former struggle. And there was a tremendous response to the anti-CAA yeah. protest. And uh, of course, uh, the COVID Very situation unique. has uh, this thing. And uh, it has shown that uh, this kind of a mass movement has got a large, large potential. impact and potential. And uh, how do you plan to sustain this S kind of strengthen them. strengthen and sustain? You, see, you had the anti-CAA. You had uh, the protest actions, uh, but, but, but for the COVID uh, this thing, it would have gone on. And also, in the question of uh, the, the resolution of Article 370 in JNK. In JNK, yeah. Then you had the farmer struggle, and the trade unions for the last four years have been in a continuous, uh, you know, battle mode. Yeah. Uh, all India's general strikes, and and most importantly, what has now happened in the last uh, two years, particularly, is the trade union movement the farmers' organizations and the agricultural labor organizations coming together on a common platform and launching this United Struggles. And that is very significant because that is putting in motion a new conflicts among yes. the Indian ruling classes itself. Yeah. That you have the farmers as a whole against the big capitalists. Big capitalists are the leaders of the Indian ruling classes. So the farmers were part of that uh, section earlier, at least the rich farmers. Yes. Uh, and, 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 and that section. But now they are in conflict with them. This entire process of the struggles have brought into a new conflict between the big capital and of the, the Adani Ambani things yeah. and the small capital, small capital. the MSMEs yes. uh, who are suffering. So that's a new conflict, new allies. We, they'll be there. And the third thing is this fiscal uh, for federalism. Fiscal. So you have a new situation where the possibility of greater allies in struggles will emerge, have emerged. And they are now part of the struggles and this is these struggles that will stretch in motion. So do you mean to say that some of these fundamental contradictions within the Indian system is bursting forth? Yes. I mean, why do you think Modi had to withdraw the farm laws? Such an arrogant Prime Minister who, who says that his, his word is the law of the land. I mean, why did he have to uh, I mean, withdraw these? Uh, Take no? a retreat. Uh, retreat. It is in the face of this, uh, this uh, and also the impact that will have on these elections. And it's having. <coughs> so that is the way forward. I am glad that after a long time, I am part of a TV discussion that discuss some substantive issues. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> nice you. And that is why your, uh, your name, which is the reverse of media, is actually uh, a point uh, to the fact that we have to reverse the content of today's media. Uh, and I hope you will su succeed in that. All the best. Thank you, sir. Thank you. <laughs>